today, Recession Saved by the Voice. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news. Well, now we know, according to the official data, that Australian households are faring worse than the broader economy and are mired in recession. The Australian economy slowed in the final three months of last year, growing just 0.2%, easing from an upwardly revised 0.3% in the prior quarter, and that's below expectations. From a year earlier, the economy grew 1.5%, and this annual result was the weakest outside the pandemic since the final quarter of the year 2000, and below the decade average of 2.4%. And ironically, we would have probably been into recession had it not been the extra activity generated around the voice. Wednesday's data showed that government spending and private business investment were the main drivers of growth, outpacing household consumption. Government spending was driven by benefits for households, with more spending on medical products and services and higher employee expenses across Commonwealth departments, the ABS said, and a referendum for an Indigenous advisory body to Parliament held during the quarter also contributed to the rise in employee expenses. The more important per capita measure, which is activity divided by population, showed that the per capita recession deepened as higher rates and rising living costs dragged on household spending, despite record migration for a fourth consecutive quarter. In per person terms, GDP fell 0.3% from the third quarter and was 1% lower than a year earlier. That's the deepest downturn also outside of the COVID-19 era since 1991. Real per capita household final consumption plunged by 2.5% in 2023. Inflation continued to impact most goods and services. The consumer price index rose 0.6% in the December quarter and was up 4.1% in the past 12 months. This was the smallest quarterly rise since March 2021. Insurance got more expensive as higher insurance premiums sent prices up 3.8%. Increased tobacco taxes saw the price of cigarettes up 7%. Wage price reviews pushed wages higher, though. The wage price index rose 0.9% during the quarter and 4.2% over the year. This was the highest recorded annual growth rate since the March quarter of 2009, and public sector wages grew 1.3% on the back of new workplace agreements, including those for teachers and nurses. The labour market has started to slow, with job vacancies falling slightly by 0.7% during the quarter, but still remained high. The unemployment rate inched up, reaching 3.9% in the month of December, as participation rates stay close to record highs. And labour productivity actually rose again. We've worked similar hours to last quarter, with the amount of time we spent at work remaining historically high. Overall, labour productivity rose 0.5% during the quarter, which was the second successive quarterly rise following a period of falling labour productivity. While the increase pushed labour productivity back to late 2019 levels, the RBA has warned that growth must be sustained at an annual rate of about 1% to prevent current rates of wage growth from fueling higher inflation. NAB Group Chief Economist Alan Oster says the strength of the underlying pace of productivity growth remains uncertain. Now, it's worth noting that one of the biggest pressures on household budgets is personal income tax, which ate up a record 16.5% of earnings over the past year as wage inflation pushed workers into higher tax brackets. Because tax brackets are not indexed to inflation, increases in nominal wages lead to increases in average taxes, since a greater proportion of all workers' pay is pushed into the higher bracket applicable to them. Economists call this bracket creep. Mortgage interest payments consumed another 4.9% of household income over the past 12 months, with further increases inevitable as borrowers feel the full effect of the 425 basis point increase in the cash rate since May 2022. Households saved just slightly more, 3.2% of their income this quarter, as compensation of employees rose 1.4%, and government social assistance benefits grew 5.9%. 
Interest on mortgages rose by 5% as some borrowers continue to come off lower fixed rate loans. And we also ate at home more with household consumption just up 0.1%. That's very meagre, following a fall of 0.2% last quarter. Spending on food rose 0.9%, while spending on catering services, pubs and clubs dropped off. Total discretionary spending by households fell 1.6% over the year. Inventories reduced as imports fell. Changes in inventories detracted 0.3 percentage points from growth, recording a $2.7 billion rundown in the December quarter. Mining inventories declined as coal inventories were run down to meet rising demand. Wholesale trade inventories also experienced a rundown driven by weaker grain production, and imports of consumer goods like food, clothing, electrical items, and cars fell 5.4% during the quarter. As imports of these goods dropped, many businesses depleted their existing inventories to meet consumer demand. Travellers had wanderlust for cheaper holidays. As many Australians headed home from their European summer adventures, spending on overseas travel fell 9% during the quarter. This reflected a shift towards destinations closer to home, led by New Zealand and Indonesia. On the other hand, spending by visitors to Australia rose 1.2% and is now above pre-pandemic levels. Businesses continue to invest. Business investment rose a modest 0.7% during the quarter, which was the 14th successive quarterly rise. Spending on new warehouses and data centres drove a 5% rise in non-dwelling building construction. Government spending outpaced household spending. Commonwealth government's expenditure, excluding defence, added 0.2 percentage points to economic growth in the December quarter, and growth was driven by more spending on government benefits for households and employee expenses, including increased Medicare expenditure, pharmaceutical benefits, and expenditure linked to the voice to parliament referendum. Defence spending fell 3.5% in the quarter, following strength in the September quarter driven by defence exercises. Household consumption growth continues to struggle against tight policy settings, said Sean Lancake, head of macroeconomic forecasting for Ox Economics in Australia. The Australian economy is in the midst of a cyclical low point, with policy settings and fast inflation curbing growth. Indeed, while growth has stayed in positive territory, it has slowed in each quarter. And in per capita terms, the economy has entered its deepest downturn outside of the pandemic since 1991. Looking ahead, we expect growth to remain sluggish and continue contracting in per capita terms through the first half of 2024, as tighter monetary policy works its way through the economy. Now, the RBA predicts that annual economic growth will trough at a 1.3% range in the middle of this year before regaining momentum, assuming a lower cash rate from then on. Treasurer Jim Chalmers argued that the fact GDP grew at all was a major achievement. The UK and Japan both finished the year in recession, he observed in a media statement. Around a quarter of G20 nations have recorded a technical recession or narrowly avoided one. And yesterday, Chinese authorities announced that they expect a period of softer growth to continue there. And Chalmers said the economy's ability to generate growth is still significant, given high interest rates locally and a challenging global backdrop. Addressing inflation is still our primary concern, but these numbers show that the balance of risks in our economy are shifting from inflation to growth, he said. And Chalmers warned that the fall in gross domestic product meant that it was unlikely Treasury would continue to receive multi-billion dollar tax windfalls as the government weighs a pre-election spending boost that could actually hit the budget bottom line. Deloitte Access Economics partner Stephen Smith pointed out that this is the slowest annual rate of economic growth since the 1990 recession. That's if you exclude the pandemic and GST introduction. He said today's data is further evidence that the November 2023 interest rate hike by the RBA was unnecessary. There is simply not enough demand in the Australian economy to justify the RBA's claim about homegrown inflation, he continued. Monetary and fiscal policy need to pivot away from containing inflation to stimulating economic growth. BetaShares chief economist David Bassanet agreed, noting that somewhat perversely, high interest rates are one reason for falling new home building, exacerbating the jump in rents that is slowing the decline in inflation. 
With falling inflation and recession levels of consumer spending and housing construction, the economy warrants less restrictive policy conditions within the next three to six months, he wrote. City chief economist Josh Williamson said the second half of the year would be better for households. Easing of inflationary pressures, no further increases in mortgage repayments, except for those rolling off from fixed rates, and the stage three tax cuts from July 1 suggest that headwinds to the household sector would ease. Moreover, consumers will still have a large pool of excess savings to draw down if confidence improves. But Westpac chief economist Lucy Ellis said the supports coming from the middle of the year, such as lower inflation and tax cuts, will be offset in part by a softer labour market and diminished pandemic-era savings reserves. And HSBC Chief Economist Paul Bloxham agreed growth would remain sluggish for the first half of 2024, but concerns around inflation would prevent the RBA from cutting rates sooner than expected. On the other hand, CBA remained comfortable with an easing cycle to commence in the third quarter of 2024, and have actually penciled in September. So the bottom line is this. If you take account of the very high migration level, real households are still going backwards, and their ability to maintain their spending patterns are now severely under pressure. But ironically, it was that spending on the failed voice which perhaps saved us from actually hitting a negative quarter And of course, two negative quarters would have actually translated into a recession. So watch and wait as we see how this plays out. I still think the inflationary pressures are stronger than many economists are seeing. And that could put a break on the ability of the RBA to cut maybe the second half, maybe into 2025. We will see. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.